All right, so ignoring that we just violated the restricted airspace, uh, as you can see, we are on autopilot, pretty straightforward. The master autopilot is engaged. We have the heading mode, it's following the heading bug here. We have the altitude hold uh, selected here, so it ho holds 3,000 feet. Um, and the obvious question is now, how do we get to 4,000 feet? Um, and this plane does not have an altitude pre-selector. I'm not quite happy with uh, the setup as it is in here, because no one in their right mind would install this very, very expensive Aztec autopilot and then do don't install the, auto, uh, the altitude pre-selector that goes along with it, the ST-360, that's what the instrument is called. It's a little um, instrument that plugs into the static system uh, and provides an, an altitude reference to the, to the autopilot so that you can pre-select an, uh, pre an altitude. Uh, but for whatever reason, we don't have this instrument in the plane here. We have this ridiculously expensive autopilot with no altitude pre-selector, and that makes flying it a little awkward. Um, but uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about how to do this. So in the real STEC, um, the, um, uh, the vertical speed mode and the, the alt mode are, uh, of course, different modes. Um, and the change over from one to another is not automatic unless you have the altitude pre-selector. So the obvious question is, hey, we climb. How do we make the autopilot uh, capture the next altitude? And I'm going to show you three methods uh, used in, in, in real life. Uh, one real bad and two real good. So the uh, first one would be uh, to just, uh, well, bring the autopilot in climb mode. I'm going to pull in and push in the power. And now we're climbing with 800 feet per minute, uh, maybe a little more. And of course, without the altitude pre-selector, you have to watch the altimeter yourself and kind of know um, uh, when to level off and anticipate that. And the absolute worst way to do it, but I've seen people do this in, in real life and I, and I cringe when I see this, is uh, going through the altitude, just press the alt hold button. <laughs> and the plane makes, uh, makes a little dance uh, because it calls it shoots right through the altitude uh, while you do that and and then it makes a little dance uh, around the altitude you actually want to catch um, which uh, of course looks looks very dumb that's one way to do it so I kind of hover my finger over the altitude button now and uh, uh, I do this at 4000 and now you and of course see what happens we blew right through 4000 the autopilot tries to go back to 4000 and catch this um, yeah not the most elegant way to do it but it works um, another way to do it obviously we go into vertical speed and um, we use the vertical speed wheel that we have here to to help us with the level off and then switch over to altitude hold. So the next best way to do it is obviously grab the, the vertical speed wheel, uh, turn it down so you hit zero at the altitude where you want to be at, and then um, and then hit altitude hold. Again, some people do this in real life. I don't really like it, but you can of course do it. So you anticipate the level off a little bit, like so, and then boop press the altitude hold just as you reach it. Okay, better than the the brutal way to do it, causes less fur poising. Um, of course now we are quite high up, I'm going to bring the mixture back a little bit, uh, bring the EGT up. 
All right, and my favorite way to do it is to use control wheel steering. And this is a mode that um, many people, including real pilots, uh, don't really know how to use or, or, or never use because it's not available on all autopilots. And the way to use it in, in X-Plane is, of course, you need to assign yourself a joystick button to it uh, because in real aircraft that have control wheel steering and basically all the modern autopilots, the STEC 55 and the uh, King autopilot, the KAP uh, 140, uh, they have control wheel steering. And in a real aircraft, you would have a, a button here on the, on the yoke um, that says CWS and that's what you press to get control wheel steering and in X-Plane you can do the same thing. Go to your joystick menu and you choose a button on the joystick that you want to use and then you search for control wheel steering mode, there it is, and assign that command to, uh, to this button. And now we can, um, now I can show you what it does. So, so basically what it does, it disengages the autopilot servos while you are holding the button pressed down. Um, you bring the airplane in the, um, in the pitch attitude you want, then you let go of the button and the autopilot trims it for you and keeps that, keeps that altitude. Alright, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to press control wheel steering. Uh, the indication is not 100% correct now. There should be a little indication that says CWS on the autopilot display now. I'm going to talk to Max to add this to our autopilot. So on the real autopilot, it would say CWS now. Um, I bring it in my appropriate pitch attitude. I let go of the button. And if you look down at the trim wheel now, the autopilot now takes care of holding that attitude. Of course, I can add full power. I can turn back on the, the heading mode obviously um, and I really really like doing this uh, for a climb rather than using vertical speed because in vertical speed mode your speed the autopilot is going to try to hold the vertical speed no matter what and I've seen people uh, get their airplane close to stall uh, with climb to altitude when the speed is decaying and the autopilot just trims and trims and trims and trims and, and tries to keep the nose up to keep the vertical speed no matter what and then flies the airplane right into the stall. Um, so yeah, a terrible idea. Better to climb, uh, so vertical speed mode is good for descent. I don't really like it for climb. A pitch hold mode is, is much better for climb actually if you don't have flight level change. So and now for the level off, what I'm going to do is I'm going to press control wheel steering again uh, fly really smooth, level off by hand, let go of control wheel steering then. And um, so as you can see, I press CWS now, anticipating the level off a little bit here. There you go. And now it uh, was a little bit too much. And at zero rate of climb, uh, further down, I let go of the CWS button. The autopilot will trim me. I press altitude hold. I'm back in altitude hold mode again. Turn on the heading mode. And that's it. So, if your autopilot does not have flight level change and does not have an, an altitude pre-selector, control wheel steering really comes in handy. I absolutely love this, and uh, it works works great in X-Plane 2. Again, the real autopilot has a little um, right here, a little. Uh, display that says CWS and we'll add that to the Cessna for X-Plane 1130. Okay, um, yeah, control wheel steering not well understood but incredibly helpful. Okay, next really small feature I want to talk about is uh, marker selective muting. Um, also not hooked up in the panel yet but available via commands. Mm. Going to bring this up here and just put it on a key on my uh, on my on a button on a joystick. How about this one? And I'm going to bring up uh, that one. Uh, marker beacon mute or off. 
God, that description is long. Okay, whatever. Um, apply. So mute marker beacons until next marker is received or indefinitely if none is switched uh, is received right now. And this is on the real Garmin audio panel what what this button really says and does. So on the real audio panel it says marker and 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 mute underneath it. And um, the behavior of the button is a little different. Um, it is it behaves like the new command that I just made. And again, for explain 11.30, we're going to rewire this button here in the panel to the command I just showed you. So briefly, what does the command do? If, if, the, if uh, we're receiving nothing right now, it's pretty obvious. If I click it, it uh, turns the marker off. And I, if I click it again, it turns the marker back on. So pretty much what you would expect from clicking on the button. Um, but it gets interesting when when we uh, actually are receiving a marker right now. And I've made a few changes to that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up the um, ILS runway 11 approach into the Columbia Metropolitan Airport, uh, which I've flown so many times. Um, and as you can see, I choose this approach because it has actually three markers, uh, outer, middle, and inner marker, because it's actually a, a, a CAT 2 and CAT 3 approach uh, is available. So here's the chart for the CAT 2 and CAT 3, but of course it's special air crew and aircraft certification required. Our oh, 172 of, of course can't do it, so we're not going to look at this chart, we're going to look at that chart over here. Uh, and as you can see, yeah, middle, inner, uh, outer, middle and inner marker, mm, you don't find that at, at many airports nowadays. And I'm going to load this and then we can actually try it. So we're going to go to uh, CAE, obviously, and we're going to fly the ILS-11 approach via the um, uh, Murray, I think. Uh, ah, no, we're just going to do a vector, whatever. I'm just going to do a vector to final here, make it a little easier. All right, we are in suspend mode now because we are on the wrong side of the final approach fix. Perfectly fine. Uh, final approach course is 112. And for the final approach fix, we want to be at 2,100 uh, feet. So going, to down, going down to 2,100. And as soon as I put ours on the right side of the final approach fix, uh, this will flip over, it will unsuspend. Yada, yada, yada. Don't need to explain this to you. All right, uh, I'm going to switch to vertical speed mode. Well, bring down the power and go down to vertical speed mode and go down to 2,100 feet. And of course, without the altitude pre-selector, uh, the altitude alert uh, is up to the pilot. Uh, we need to pay a little attention here. Why, is the, why are the taxi lights on? Should be no reason why the taxi lights should be Okay. Ah, oh, another thing that I fixed for 11.20. Uh, not many people noticed this, but uh, I fixed it. If we fail the um, the static port, the, the, the pilot static port on the 172. Uh, static. Static port number one fail. Blup. Okay, apply should be failed now. Yeah, there you go. Auto, uh, uh, altimeter is frozen. Vertical speed mode doesn't work. And the 172 has a little uh, button down here under the throttle that says all static air pull on. And what it does, it bypasses the static port and instead takes the cabin pressure, which, because the 172 isn't pressurized, is more or less equal to outside pressure and uses that for the altimeter, for the static system. And that, I think, didn't work until now or until 11.20, I don't remember. I just remember fixing it. So we grab this thing, pull it out, and as you can see, blop, uh, static system works again.
So the idea with this uh, marker selective muting button, of course, is um, to to cancel the marker you're currently over and rearm the system for the next marker. And by the way, there's another button that's missing on the audio panel here. Uh, this one, that's the marker sensitivity, also was not simulated or is not simulated in Explain 1120. I added it for 1130. Uh, yeah, we can play around with this as well. Made a command for that as well. Uh, let's see which button can we use. Yeah, how about this one? Uh, marker, marker sense toggle. There you go. That's the command I'm looking for. Uh, yeah, for 11:30, we'll just put it on this this button right here. Um, so basically, what it does, it, it changes the sensitivity of the marker beacon receiver, so you can turn it to low sensitivity, so it doesn't go off when you fly 10,000 feet uh, over the marker. Uh, right now in X-Plane, I don't think there's, there's, there's a limit, so if you fly at cruise altitude and just happen to fly across a marker that, that sits at, at an airport 10 kilometers below you, uh, the marker receiver will go off. Uh, it will do that in high sensitivity, but if you switch over to low sense, um, it does two things. For one, it, it will not go off when you un until you're like, I don't know, a maximum of a couple thousand feet over the marker. The other thing is it makes the reception cone of the marker a little sharper. So the marker will uh, be will start flashing, will become active a little later than it is now and it'll turn off a little earlier than it does now. So yeah, lower sensitivity equals higher precision. Uh, yeah, that's what it does and that's what I added. Um, certainly not the most exciting feature in the world, but as an IFR instructor, I, I care for that kind of thing. Um, yeah, let's vector ourselves around on the final approach course now. So yeah, that's Lake Murray over here. People I know have a CB out here. I don't know exactly which bay, but yeah, in one of those bays, uh, they have a beautiful lakefront uh, lakefront property with a, with a house on the lakefront and a boat ramp only they don't have a boat that goes on the boat ramp but a Republic CB which is a great great um, seaplane um, okay let's bring up the uh, so 2100 feet again no no um, alert. We have to find that ourselves. Two hundred feet to go, and you will see me do the exact same thing. I just put it in control wheel steering, uh, level of the plane, and then let go of the CWS button and put it in altitude hold for the time being. So here we go, CWS off, altitude hold engage, bring up the power, bring up the mixture. Okay, we can go to GPS mode for now. Final approach course, 112. Whoops, what the hell, there you go. One, one, two, and let's see what is our ILS. Oh, heh, <laughs> wind from the wrong side. That's why the ILS is turned off. Hang on, we can fix that. We can fix that. Uh, customize wind. Yeah, two nine or zero. Uh, no, hang on, 1-1, one, one. we want to land on runway 1-1, one, one, right? Yeah, just give it two knots of wind, and that should give us the ILS on that side. Apply. What do you know? Here's the ILS, 110.30. Okay. All right. ILS mode on. Approach mode arm, obviously. Oh, and we actually do have an ADF receiver in this plane. What do you know? What's the frequency for Murray? 
Uh, I don't think I've ever, ever flown an airplane with an ADF receiver there in real life. Oh, so I have no idea what the frag is. 362! Okay, 362. What do you know? Let's see if this works. Three. Alright, now I'm going to turn up the sim sound a bit so you can actually hear what's going on. There you go. Oh, and as you can see, I had to twist the heading mode to the ILS front course. A couple of people have complained about this in the forum, but this is absolutely realistic. That's exactly how the real thing works. Um, if you don't have an HSI and you don't have an HSI course signal to the autopilot, the autopilot gets the front course for VOR or ILS mode from the heading, heading bug on the DG, which is why it needs to be turned to the ILS front course. The autopilot does not talk to this front course it takes the heading bug as the front course. Yep, very confusing, um, but exactly as the thing works in, in real life if you have no HSI in the plane. Alright, so we have, this is the final approach fix here, five miles to go at the final approach fix. There's the uh, outer marker and I will actually um, turn the marker to low sense right now. I don't think I have a data ref for that yet. Um, so we get the... Oh no, using high sense now and I'll turn it down to low sense for the little sharper indication on the, on the middle marker instead. By the way, someone filed a bug report that the voltage light wasn't working right either on the on this 172 nor on the G1000 one. We also fixed that. That's going to ship with uh, Beta 4 actually. Uh, so hopefully real soon now. TM. So the change you're going to notice is that the marker sound kind of comes up slowly uh, and, and then fades. So you get a real uh, indication of when you're actually overflying the marker. Uh, the sound used to be binary, it was either on or off. So you would just get this constant beeping while you were kind of sort of over the marker. And, and now with the, with the reception cone, uh, that works properly with a low and high sensitivity. Uh, you, you will get this, this ramp up of the sound and the ramp down of the sound as you fly over the thing. And, and that gives you a little bit better indication of uh, where you actually are. Really helps with the, um, with the outer marker altitude check. Um, yeah, because if the thing just keeps beeping for 20 seconds, uh, yeah, that doesn't really help with checking the flyover altitude. So I'm going to go to make sure you can hear it.
hear the ramp up and the ramp down of the sound. Okay, now what I... Yeah, okay, that was too late. Actually, it would actually be helpful if we just brought the... Uh, uh, I don't know exactly which slider it is on. Oh, whatever. Alright, not the biggest change in the world, but I really like it. So the next thing we can do is uh, show the selective mute. So the le selective mute, uh, very simple. When I hit the middle marker, I'm going to press the selective mute button. Uh, and that cancels the middle marker. Uh, so it'll keep flashing, but I will not hear it but it instantly rearms for the inner marker so I can mute the middle marker and wait for the inner marker. Okay, at this point, of course, final approach check. Uh, yeah, gas, undercarriage, mixture, prop, flaps, and uh, switches. So as you can see, when I press the selective mute button now, it just toggles the light here. And, and you will see that when I press the selective mute while it is actually beeping, uh, it'll just turn off the sound momentarily. The light will stay on, giving you the indication that it it, it is actually not turned off. That's kind of helpful. marker so selective mute you see it's still flashing I turned off the sound the light is still on and the system is now armed again for the inner marker and hopefully you can hear the ramp up and ramp down of the sound real good now yeah I think that was obvious um, so this was flown in high sensitivity mode, and if I switch that to low sensitivity mode, um, the, the cone gets sharper and the marker indication gets even sharper. Okay, not the most exciting feature in the world, but I kind of like it. Um, now I'm going to switch us into the, um, into the Cirrus jet, and we'll do something more fun, something more exciting, hopefully. Uh, yeah, I'm going to put us like on a 10 mile approach so that we start out already in the air. That would be helpful.
So what I'm going to um, do, what I'm going to demonstrate is uh, an emergency descent from a pressurization failure. And the reason why I care for this right now is uh, twofold. Uh, for one, I received my high altitude endorsement last year, about yeah half a year ago. Uh, I got my real world high altitude endorsement for flying pressurized planes and, and part of the um, the stuff you need to do to get the, the high altitude endorsement is a couple of those emergency descents while you're actually wearing the mask. And yeah, I added a couple of features to X-Plane 1130 after, after I did the endorsement in real life. And that is I added an oxygen bottle to X-Plane. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so uh, right now it's a data ref. Um, it's added to Plane Maker for 1130. In 1130 Plane Maker, you can give your plane uh, uh, like a 450 liter oxygen bottle. Mm. And then uh, let me show you the data refs, and then it should make it pretty obvious what's going on. Uh, yeah, you have a valve on the oxygen bottle that you can, uh, well, open or close, obviously. Um, and then you can plug in several people into the oxygen system. Uh, I mean, how many are sitting in, in the cockpit, so it defaults to a crew of two. And then you have a demand regulator that has a couple of modes. Um, I already wrote an, an internal blog post for that. We'll set that public soon. Uh, so right now I think two is, uh, is a daytime immediate mode. Uh, yeah, just going to leave it there. Um, so if I can get Max to do it, uh, we have the oxygen masks modeled up here. If I can get Max to actually <laughs> trick something that it looks like you have, you wear the mask over your face, that would be awesome. But uh, don't hold your breath for it, haha, <laughs> pun intended, um, that we actually get this modeled in 3D. But the data refs actually work and that's kind of cool. So I'm going to put the plane at high altitude now, 28,000 feet. And of course now it's going, probably going bonkers when I put it out of pause. Oh, oh, actually not as bad as I thought. All right, autopilot, altitude hold for now, and heading hold. And whatever is in the GPS right now, I don't care. Ah, ah, this is f yeah, okay, because I'm, yeah, because it still has loaded the, the approach. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, better. I can, I can kill that, so it doesn't uh, set us right now, and just put it into like nearest mode to the nearest airport. Okay. All right, and over here on the MFD, we can see the pressurization system. It's doing its thing. We have five and a half, five point six uh, psi of diff pressure. Uh, outside pressure obviously is twenty-eight thousand five hundred feet. Cabin pressure is uh, at a pressure altitude of a comfortable eight and a half thousand feet, which is nice. And um, of course, what we are going to do now is uh, well fail the, the cabin pressure system and then put on the oxygen mask and see what that does. Um, so just to make sure I want to have my oxygen data refs right here so I can see what the system is doing. So you can see this new data ref here, the pilot felt altitude and this is how good you feel. And of course, you right now feel pretty good because you're in a pressurized environment. It's all pretty nice. Um, the oxygen bottle has... It should have... I, I gave it 450 liters, right? So 450 liters remaining, of course, if you set it up in Plane Maker, it'll come from there. Um, 
and we have 1800 psi of oxygen and of course that'll drop as we use it so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to give us a cabin pressure failure and then I simulate putting on the oxygen mask by basically just setting this data ref to 1 and then we're going to do an emergency descent alright and the thing I want to show you about the emergency descent is um, here's how you don't do it um, so autopilot goes off uh, the way not to do it is just nose over this is a terrible idea uh, because while well, you're in a panic you are in an emergency situation you just had so it makes a terrible noise it makes a loud bang whatever failed there probably a door lock or a latch or whatever so a loud bang the air is rushing out of the cabin there's tremendous noise um, the um, the moisture that is in the air immediately condenses so you have fog in the cockpit um, uh, it gets terribly cold piece of paper whatever you have in the cockpit is flying around um, so this is of course uh, not uh, can I turn off ah, there you go can I turn ah I did not ah, that's why it was in CBS okay um, so you're kind of in a you're in a total panic situation and the last thing you want to do there is nose over the aircraft and pull a lot of negative G's yeah and and of course in this, this panic situation you have no idea how many negative G's you're actually pushing on the stick so this is this is not how you do it no. the way to do it is um, you roll off the lift vector and just let the nose drop so and rolling off the lift vector is just a fancy way of saying put the airplane in a steep turn put it in a really high angle of bank something like in excess of 60 degree so you're not flying an actual steep turn because you're not pulling two G's to keep the altitude so instead of pulling back and keeping the altitude what you do is you just let the nose drop roll off the lift vector to the side by 70 or uh, 60 or 70 degrees um, let the nose drop don't push uh, pull back on the stick and this way even if you go unconscious until you reach I don't know 15,000 feet or so the airplane will descend it will not overspeed and you have no chance of like accidentally damaging the structure by excessive negative G's if you just push forward on the stick all right without further ado failures cabin uh, no it's I think it's called pressurization right yeah so rapid depressurization this this will give us a few seconds that we have to put on the oxygen mask and then we just do our emergency descent so as soon as I click down here what's going to happen is I run out of oxygen the um, the uh, the pilot health if you will this one uh, is going to rapidly uh, suffer uh, we're going to get a blackout and if we put on the the oxygen mask uh, it'll help with the blackout so here we go BAM pressurization failure you can see here cabin altitude in the red you can see my screen go dark oh my god I'm getting unconscious so what do we do pull the mask put it over our head and turn on the oxygen valve blup and you can see the pilot's health is increasing my screen is uh, coming back to normal brightness again all right power all the way back and now just what I said you roll off the lift vector and you just let the nose drop and as you can see here in this configuration yeah we are gaining speed but um, um, but look at our rate of descent look at the rate of descent 11,000 feet per minute 10,000 feet per minute yeah this is this is the rate of descent that you want in, in case of a, a pressurization emergency, right? So, roll off the lift vector, bring bring back the power, and just keep the airplane in an extreme bank. And, and, and that gives you a real, real, real good rate of descent. Uh, and, and, and you're not running the danger of, of nosing over and pushing excessive negative G. Uh, yeah, because pushing excessive negative G is the last thing you want to do in a panic. And, and this is more natural in, uh, 
this is more natural because in a panic you're you're not going to push the stick forward you're you're trying to hold one g Th that is easier to do uh if you are in kind of a panic mode than than nosing over so yeah of course that looks uh, kind of exciting from the outside obviously Whoop. so yeah roll of the lift vector and this is this is a real good emergency descent this is what the what the emergency descent should look like yeah emergency descent with uh, still seven eight thousand feet per minute descent rate all right now we're down to twelve thousand or so at this altitude we can uh, call off this emergency ah did you see the g1000 go out of the uh unusual attitude mode that's kind of cool um all right, and at this altitude, we can bring stuff back to normal. Go into altitude hold, go into uh, put the, the autopilot back on. Uh, yep, on select. And uh, at this altitude, we can take off our mask, and our pilot health should still be good. All right, so what you can see, we've used about five liters of oxygen doing that. The bottle pressure is now down to 1780 uh, PSI. Uh, I turn the valve closed. My pilot altitude comes back to what we actually have right now, 11,500. 11, it's in the red because it's not super comfortable for passengers, but... Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely survivable. So yeah, that is the pressurization emergency. The the, the way you train it uh, in in an actual airplane. Of course, the <laughs> in the actual airplane we don't open the door or drill a hole in the window. Uh, the way it works, the um, the uh, instructor uh, at some point <coughs> claps and starts the clock, and after the instructor. Uh, has set off the, t the the timer. You have five seconds to put on your mask, put the strap over your your head, turn on the oxygen, and put the plane into an emergency descent. And yeah, and you do that. I don't know, four or five times. Uh, first time, of course, you get all tangled up with the mask and the headset because uh, what you actually need to do is take off your headset, put the mask on, put the heads headset back over. <laughs> That <laughs> of course takes a few seconds, and, and then uh, yeah, you put it in this uh, steep spiral emergency descent. That's how it's done. Okay, uh, that's all I have for now. We talked about autopilot. We talked about markers. We talked about oxygen. We talked about emergency descent. Uh, so I think that's all the topics I have. Uh, we have a few. Do we actually have any new features in here that are not in 11.20? I don't remember. I would need to look at the at the git log. Um, yeah, we need to take a look at the git log to see what we actually have. But um, Oh, by the way, does control wheel steering work with the altitude hold here? Let's try that. Oh, by God, it does. Okay, it takes the alt bug with you. Okay, it's not 100% real. In the real one, it does it in steps of 10 and not go with every single foot. It'll just switch in steps of 10. Uh, yeah, I guess I need to need to fix that. <laughs> Alright, something for my to-do list. Can definitely do that. Okay. How about manual gear release? Ah, you mean to get some extra drag? Um, that depends on your uh, VLO speed. Um, on your uh, landing gear operation speed. If you can lower the gear at a high airspeed, yes, that absolutely helps with the emergency descent because you have more drag. Um, if you have a low VLO, it doesn't help that much because you have the gear down, but you also have to keep your speed 
down be below the gear extension speed and and lower airspeed equals a lower rate of descent so uh, yeah it depends if I'm if I'm in a, in a in a Piper arrow where the landing gear extension speed is actually higher than the cruise speed and that's not because the VL Oh, it's very high. It's because the cruise speed is so pathetic. Um, in a Piper Arrow for an emergency descent, yeah, I would put the gear down and, and just use the extra drag that gives me. Um, if you're doing this in, in, a, in a high performance plane with a high cruise speed and a lower VLO, not much point in doing it because you have to stay so slow with the gear down that it doesn't help with the descent rate at all. Yeah, hope I answered that question. All right, that's it. I guess that concludes tonight's uh, flying lesson. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good one.